And uh, let's go ahead and get started, everyone. I am really excited, again, just to repeat this, that you're all here with us this evening. Uh, we are in unprecedented times, so the fact that we can all convene in this way from, you know, as far away. Linda, are you in the Upper Peninsula of Michigan? You are, yes. Looks like it. Or are you in Tennessee these days? No, I'm, we're, we arrived back in the UP today, so I'm at Lake Superior. Uh, excellent. Yep. So the Upper Peninsula of Michigan to here in New York City to New Orleans. I saw someone you lost LA. on my screen. Mary, welcome. Uh, hi, Rick, welcome. Um, I just want to uh, thank you all for joining us this evening. I hope that everyone is happy, healthy, uh, safe, and sound. Your families are all good. Your partners and relations and friends are all okay in these uh, very unprecedented times that seem to be unending and um, only getting worse, not better, um, unfortunately. Uh, this is our inaugural Zoom artist talk. I'm really happy to organize this and um, I hope to do more of these with uh, amazing individuals like Ken uh, starting in the new year, possibly monthly is what I'm thinking, uh, just so we can convene and talk shop. Um, but before we get started, just a few bits of housekeeping, uh, just to keep things kind of in order. Uh, for those of you that are joining us, I am recording tonight's session. Uh, I do that uh, because there are a number of people who have told me they can't be here this evening. So just know that we're recording this and we're gonna share that recording with those folks who have registered uh, for tonight's uh, talk. Uh, in the spirit of inclusiveness, I would also encourage all of you to update your screen names if you are so able to with your preferred gender pronouns. Uh, you can scroll over my image, uh, you could probably see I've changed mine. Uh, if you uh, don't know how to do that, if you scroll over your own video uh, on the upper right hand corner of your video stream, you'll see a couple of dots, dot, 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 and you can rename yourself there. Um, again, with your own preferred gender pronouns, he, uh, he, him, she, her, they, them, or any combination thereof um, as you see fit, of course. Um, again, you're welcome to broadcast your video. Uh, I love being able to see your faces. Ken is appreciative of that too, of course, uh, but you don't need to be on video if you don't feel comfortable, uh, but definitely keep yourselves muted for the time being as we have a sort of a half an hour conversation uh, before we open it up to uh, audience questions uh, around 7.30, if that's okay. Um, now, uh, for those of you that don't know me, my name is Matthew Delegate. I am the uh, owner, co-founder of Minus Space in Dumbo, Brooklyn. I co-founded the gallery back in 2003 with my wife, Rosanna Martinez, and we're still going strong. We're surviving uh, these difficult and challenging times, which is uh, miraculous, I think, at this point, just to sustain is a small miracle. Uh, small fees. Um, I'm an artist. Uh, I'm a visual artist. I am a gallerist. I've curated many shows over the past uh, 15 years, uh, and I'm an educator um, and wear lots of other hats. I'm sure all of you do this as well. This is not a surprise uh, at all that we multitask uh, because we do whatever it takes, like whatever is needed, of course. Um, the gallery, as you know, we specialize in reductive abstraction. Uh, we present the past, present, and future of reductive art on the international level. Uh, we've been organizing exhibitions uh, since 2006. We originally started as an online project uh, back when the internet was the Wild West um, and thus the, uh, the minus uh, space um, uh, name that we adopted at that time. Um, I would like to uh, formally welcome Ken Weathersby. He's on the upper left-hand corner of my screen. Ken, welcome. Everybody uh, say hello to Ken. And um, I would like to say a few words of introduction. Um, Hi, Ken, everyone. Uh, was born in Gulfport, Mississippi in 1963. And he currently lives in Montclair, New Jersey. Uh, go Montclair. I'm in South Orange, New Jersey at the moment. Uh, we moved here last summer. Very excited to be on this side of the river after 25 years in Brooklyn. Uh, Ken's studio is at the terrific gallery of Faro studio space in downtown Newark. I don't know if anyone has been there, been there for their open studios. Mary Birmingham, I believe you've been there. You've heard of it, right? She yes. has. Okay, good. I'm pointing you out here, of course. Uh, but if you haven't had a chance to check it out, when things return to normal, please do. There are lots and lots of exhibitions and events and open studios uh, there, and there's a ton going on in downtown Newark, so can't say enough uh, about that. Uh, Ken has exhibited his work nationally and internationally for the past three decades. 
He uh, has mounted uh, several, now what, two solo exhibitions with us. He participated at, at a group exhibition already over the past few years. He's also mounted solo exhibitions of note at Pierogi Gallery in uh, New York City, One River Gallery in Englewood, New Jersey, the Nyad Art Center Gallery in Richmond, California, Some Walls in Oakland, California, and the John Cotton Dana Gallery at Rutgers University in uh, Newark. He's received lots and lots of awards and participated in residencies. Most recently, he is the recipient of the Individual Artist Painting Fellowship from the Mid-Atlantic Arts Council, New Jersey State Council on the Arts. That took place in 2016. So congratulations on that, Ken. His work has been written about widely, including in Hyperallergic, The Huffington Post, Brooklyn Magazine, New American Paintings, and uh, elsewhere. He holds an MFA in painting from Cranbrook Academy of Art in Bloomfield Hills, Michigan. And I know some, oh, there's Bob, give him the thumbs up. He went to school with you. He's representing, yes, Bloomfield, Cranbrook. love it, Cranbrook. And he also holds a BFA in painting and drawing from the University of Southern Mississippi in Hattiesburg, Mississippi. Now, as I mentioned, this is Ken's second solo exhibition here with us at the gallery. And he is presenting his new dream paintings, uh, which merge abstraction and texts that have been transcribed from his dreams. How about that? So I'm gonna go ahead and turn it over to Ken now, who would like to begin uh, this evening by sharing some images with you. And, uh, Ken, yes. go ahead and take it away. I will and do that. Thank you. And welcome everybody. A guy was writing a book. He was sweating profusely because it made him nervous. I was a lawyer and someone peeked in at me through the window. All the bungalows had strange open fronts with walls folding in as if made of paper. The group discussed the design of a mechanism, a hinge or a lock. We saw it projected and considered its workings. Someone somewhere screamed. It was strange, a single high unwavering note. I wondered if it came from the corridor and with my eyes closed, tried to imagine where. When I looked again, we stood on a subway platform. A woman lay curled up in a pile of blankets and coats. Someone reached over and gently touched her face. She opened her eyes and told us she was anxious about the interview. A big man in high-waisted pants sat in a skiff at the edge of the lake. He tried to persuade us with his soft voice. His point was oblique. He wanted us to trust him and believe something strange. I could see his hands as he spoke. He was creating a golf club, a driver. He showed that the head of the club was full of soil and contained a tiny version of itself, the size of a pecan. I could tell that he wanted to hypnotize us. Inside a nearby cottage, a woman amplified the man's efforts with her own voice, quoting a dead Russian. We were fed up and wanted to leave. Her husband was there and alert to our anger. I noticed shelves all around the room holding rows of clay figures. The front door had a window with a view of the lake. Tiny figures were lined up against the glass of the window, obscuring the view. Light streamed in over them, making them beautiful. A friend told us that in the video, he was, quote, headed for the falls. Then we watched, but it wasn't what we expected. He was in a tiny boat and it was night. Behind him in the distance, a huge wall of water crashed down from above over stones. We'd assumed that he meant going over the falls from the top, like going over a cliff, 
not going into it from below. He got closer and closer. It was dark, but there were bright lights flashing, lenting off everything. The sparkling light reminded me of the Catherine Bradford painting that's like a hallucination of ships at night that seemed to become strange figures. As he approached the falls, he stared intently at a little statue across from him in the boat. Its back was to us. Was it a Buddha or something other? Behind him, I could see a rampart of stone lines going up and up and up. The roar from the waters pouring over them had to be deafening, and I suspected that this thing must be staged. How could he not hear that? Just when he reached the pounding waters, when I was sure he would be swamped and maybe drowned, there was a cut to him standing in the boat and holding his arms up in triumph as he floated off down a stream we couldn't see before, brightly lit by the sunshine of a clear dawn. I was at actor Jim Carrey's house in Arizona. He showed interest in so many things, but he was sick. I looked through the papers on his table and found an essay about an avant-garde film. I was surprised he knew of it. He eagerly asked me many questions. I assured him that his creativity would return when he got well. I said, gesturing with my finger as if writing in the air. First you do a little something, then it leads you on. He picked up a vegetable that looked like a squash, but it was cut in half and juicy and red inside like a watermelon. He strapped it onto his face and turned toward me. The green and yellow striped skin had a protruding bump like a nose, so it became an abstract face. Then it became a very lifelike woman's face with rubbery skin and dark eyelashes. He peered out at me between the lashes. Thought I would give you a little bit of a different experience of the image and the dream together. Fantastic, Ken. So uh, clearly, you were reading the the narratives or the sort of the dream text that you wrote into uh, an insight into each of these paintings, right? Exactly. And, and that that experience of seeing both at the same time, I realized, is not actually quite possible when you're in the gallery because you're either looking at the whole or you're moving in close to read the text. And it's a sort of a, an orbit between the two. But in this format, I can give you both at the same time. So yeah, but we don't do that. that luxury of hearing you read it out loud to us, which is really unusual to hear you <laughs> reading your dreams to us. And I hadn't heard, heard myself read them out loud so before start, either. Start by that. Oh, interesting. I know Michelle's in here somewhere. Maybe she's heard some of these uh, before, but um, uh, a question for you. So these dreams, right? So you've been note-taking, record-keeping, recording your dreams for how long? Um, there have been phases I've gone through of doing this over the years, but this kind of pile of dream texts that I have now goes back about five or six years. Uh, I started doing that without any uh, objective in mind. I didn't have a purpose in mind for it. It was more, I was remembering them a little bit. And uh, once I um, once I wrote a few down, I sort of got, I was interested enough to keep doing it whenever I could. And, and you know, what I found was that it's, uh, if anyone's done that, I know lots of people try, you know, go through phases maybe of, of remembering or writing down dreams. I and mean, we all dream every night, pretty much, they, they tell us. Uh, but it, certainly if you, if you don't think about it, you don't remember it and you don't catch it early on in the morning, at least for me, it's gone. And I forget that it ever happened. Um, anyway, I, I think about, it goes back about five or six years, this little, this folder full of dreams that I have. And I have a couple hundred, I think that I, I really had most of those together before I started doing these paintings. And how do you go about recording these? Do you have like a notebook next to the bed or a couch or, or how, does that, how does that sort of notation happen? Um, I'm, I'm a big, uh, I'm a sketchbook 
keeper for, for many, many years, probably since about 1981. So I always have a sketchbook in progress. And uh, if I can remember it long enough to get uh, some notes down before I'm fully awake, then, then I've got it. Otherwise it's gone. But uh, really, yeah, just, just within the first half hour after I wake up, maybe, maybe just write a little bit down and then I've got it. And I, I try to, to not do any composing. I try to make it as, as true to the experience as possible. I mean, I, I think there's a, there is an element of translation because what, you know, you're talking about something that's a visual and a tactile experience. It's not all verbal and you're, you're putting it into words, but I, I, all I can say is I, um, I don't want to feel like I'm controlling it or, or, or editing too much. So I, 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 in a way, I feel like if I do it uh, before I'm fully awake in a way, then I'm true to, to the experience. Mm -hmm. Great. And, yeah. and so you're, you're writing these dreams down almost you know, simultaneous to having them in that first 30 minutes. You're putting them down in a notebook and you've been doing this for many years already. Um, how did you decide then to sort of excerpt certain dreams uh, for the paintings we have on with the gallery? I think we've got about 13 paintings all together. So what was it, was it about these 13 dreams that really struck you or stuck with you? Um, part of my thought was there's a kind of, um, you know, I, I think this is already uh, stated or given in my previous response. There's a way that I, I'm trying to keep my hand out of it as much as possible. I'm trying not to impose too much or put my preconceptions into it. So uh, I had this folder full of dreams and more or less I started with the first one chronologically and then was moving through them in order rather than uh, sifting and selecting. I, and I, so I, I, I forced myself not to do that kind of uh, conscious choice making about it as much as possible. Although, you know, the process is, is sometimes sloppy and maybe I made mistakes in that, but that's not the same as, as uh, saying, oh, this is a cool one, you know, I'll take this one. I, I really tried to go in order in order that they occurred. Right, so the dreams that you then selected were just based on sort of the natural way that they had happened in your, in your life rather than some other kind of editorial or curatorial thing, um, right? Right, right, I, I trust that more. Interesting, and you would talk about sort of um, in your interview that you recently posted, I hope everyone saw that on, um, we have it actually posted on our, our homepage, you can check it out from there in, uh, what's the name of the publication? Interlocutor. Interlocutor. Thank you, Interlocutor. Um, new uh, interview that just came out with Ken as well. But in that interview and in our um, in your writings, you talk about you know sort of things that are you know ranging from everything from sort of being monumental to totally banal and absurd, and there really being no hierarchy between them. Yeah, I, I mean, I think um, one thing that might one might think about, uh, you know, oh, I'm, I'm drawing upon my dreams, one might think that it's an idea of it being, you know, really profound or somehow revealing of some deep thing. And maybe that's true sometimes, but I, I'm not coming from a place of assuming that that's true. And I also think it might be just as uh, likely something very banal, or it might be nonsensical. But what interests me about it and the value of it is something apart from that, which is that it's not, I think in the interview, uh, it's the way I said it was, it's not, um, it's not a marketing campaign. It's not ideologically driven. It's not controlled in that way. It's something that, that escapes all that. And there's so little, you know, where do we see a text these days that, that doesn't feel like it, there's a kind of a, a manipulation or an agenda behind it. And that's a place where uh, maybe the dream is infected by those things, but it does not answer to those things. It's something, it's one of the few uh, territories of experience and, and things like that, things that aren't consciously controlled or, or among the few territories of experience that don't seem 
uh, oppressively uh, driven by, let's say, marketing. Interesting. So, so how are you then? So you were taking these individual sort of moments, these individual dreams, and you were pairing them then with sort of abstract forms, geometric patterns, sometimes they're decorative motifs, you know, floral motifs, and you're sort of pairing them up with specific dreams. How do you go about matching one with the other, or are they, or is there some of the rationality unmatched in a way? Um, again, that's an area where I'm, I'm really trying to keep my conscious choice making out of it into a large degree. Um, I cannot deny that there are some funny coincidences and maybe some uh, uh, connections that, that also occur. But an abstract painting is also something that, that already has, um, doesn't have a clear agenda necessarily or a clear narrative. Maybe it does sometimes have an agenda, but it's, it's arguable and it's, and it's ambiguous at least if it's really very abstract. So um, that pairing hopefully um, is productive. Putting those two things, there's a resonance or not between them, but um, I'm working very hard to withhold too much direction of that. Um, the work that preceded this had images, uh, uh, other kinds of images, images of human beings in sculpture or photographs that I took of human beings paired with abstract images. And so it was that encounter that I was interested in. And in this case, it, I, you know, I thought, well, what, I, I, I wanna go even farther afield, something that's not even an image, a text, and it's the encounter that, I, that I'm really interested in. And, and well, how can that be productive? Great, great. And it was interesting that you read the paintings early on. Um, I really appreciated you uh, hearing these narratives in your own voice. And um, it's, it's remarkable how these paintings are both sort of visual and verbal and visual verbal at the same time. They're meant to be looked at and read and then you lean into them because the scripting is so, in some cases, minute. But you really have to sort of crank your neck and to see what's happening in these paintings. And I think it's an unusual combination to be sort of like, verbal in this way, but also sort of like they're so graphic and, you know, patterned and geometric in some, some other instances. When I've had visitors at the gallery, um, they sort of reacted to them in a lot of different ways, really responding sometimes to the language, sometimes to the scripting, sometimes to the delicacy of the line work that's going on in them. Um, what do you hope visitors will take away from these paintings when you when they come in and they're looking at them? How are they supposed to sort of interface with them in the best case scenario? I like uh, your uh, description of the wide range of kinds of responses. Uh, I feel like that's the, um, for me, interesting art is art that is open-ended enough for me to respond to in a number of different ways. So if that's what's happening, then I'm glad. I mean, you mentioned the um, this uh, thing about having to kind of move in on them. And that, that's something I've always been interested in. I mean, even the really more abstract work that I was doing, you know, 10 years ago, I liked having um, a kind of a, a, a the marking and, and sort of pen, the pencil of like laying things out with some a trace was always there. And so um, there was a reason to get close to it and there was a reward for getting close to it. Uh, I, you know, I, um, what happens right on the surface is interesting to me. Uh, there, there's a lot of kind of levels to things you can see. It's, in, it's funny because I feel like there's almost a contradiction in, what I've been saying so far, a lot of it has been sort of been about withholding my uh, sense of control of what's happening. And yet at the same time, there's a lot that I'm very interested in. I'm interested in the uh, things that are, that exist in between uh, control and deliberateness and things that have to be a certain way and areas where things can have uh, you know, uh, randomness or can move out of line or can uh, move in other ways or escape control. Uh, that, that territory between those things interests me a lot, not just in having um, 
you know, choice making about what text or whatever, but also, um, you know, what it, what a line or a color can do on the surface. In that same way, those things interest me a lot. So, you know, I think that's all part of the process. Um, okay, so I'm talking about it from the point of view of process. What should people get from it? I think those things, those are the things that are available for people to see. And if, if people connect with that or appreciate that, then I'm happy. Fantastic. Great. Thank you, Ken. Uh, just keeping an eye on the time, and we've got more than 50 people here. I'm going to stop talking. How about that? Uh, that's a first uh, for those of you that know me. And I think what, what I would like to do now is actually turn it over to our audience here uh, for questions. Um, I'm sure that you have many questions for Ken. Some of you have known him since graduate school. Others may be brand new to his work, or you might know Ken in other capacities. And I would love to turn it over to you uh, to ask questions. And I see we have a question already that's come up privately in the chat. And there's a couple of ways to ask questions. Uh, so I'm just gonna throw them out there and dive in. Um, feel free to type into the chat field. You can locate that at the bottom of your dashboard. You can click that open, it'll pop open a slide screen on the right-hand side if you wanna type a question in. Or if you are physically able, feel free to raise your hand and uh, or hit the reactions button at the bottom of your screen. It'll also raise your hand for you. And uh, we can take it from there. Um, there are some questions that have come in, Ken. I'll just read them out loud to you, Great. that's okay. Mm -hmm. So um, are the patterns in any way specific to the dream is the first question. Um, well, I'm pairing them together. So they become specific to the dream. I'm not consciously choosing them uh, in a rational way to match the dream, but um, I, they, they are specific once the painting is made. Uh, and the, the source, this isn't actually the question, but the sources of the, of the patterns are very wide ranging. There are things that are uh, based on uh, fabric and wallpaper patterns from decades past. There are ones that are completely invented. Uh, there are ones that come from um, images and films. Uh, and the um, wide range of sources. And I think in some ways there are connections, but not clear conscious connections that I could spell out beforehand. Terrific. There's that one work, Ken, that you also uh, presented that had the two images in it. Uh, one was a sort of a field of text and the other was that uh, pre-Columbian esoteric sort of napped flint piece. Mm -hmm. And that one isn't a depicted pattern at all. What, what is that one, Ken? Uh, yeah, that painting has a, um, it's a bed sheet, actually. Uh, Why I, don't you show us that one again, if you can. Oh, that's a good idea. Show that one, you want me to pull it up? Mm -hmm. Can you pull it up, Matthew? Yeah, go right ahead. Okay. Uh, the, um, yeah, the pattern in that one, the surface of that one is actually a bed sheet rather than a uh, painted pattern as most of them are. Um, it was just an, an old sheet that was a, a kind of like an inherited thing that we had and actually slept under for years. Uh, and I was interested in the pattern on that sheet actually before I was doing the dream paintings because there was a grid that that's it. That's the one. There's a grid in that on that printed, you know, just a printed uh, grid on that cotton sheet that was almost an exact match for some paintings that I had been doing previously with wood lattices. And it was the same scale and there's kind of almost an image of a drop shadow uh, in, within the pattern. And um, so I was already interested in that and had taken some pieces out of it to use for another artwork before the dream paintings even started. Um, and I picked it for this dream painting. I don't, I, I don't think I, here's, here's how not conscious my choices were. I don't think I thought at all about how I'm using a bed sheet for something to do with the dream until after the piece was done. But what I liked about it, one thing I liked about it was if you look at the image and you see where the cutout uh, inset recessed area is with the text of the dream at the top left, there seems to be sort of a, a glow around that. I think you can see it bigger in the whole image actually. There's a kind of a, um, an aura, a glow around that. And that's not the lighting in the room. And it's not something that if it was a painted pattern, 
would have been done with mi paint mixtures and, and maybe, you know, brushwork or whatever. But in the case of this, it was a, an old and very worn sheet. And that was just an area that was worn so thin that the white underpainting uh, came through and sort of um, uh, has a has a chiaroscuro effect uh, as if that area is glowing. And again, not a thoroughly conscious choice, but something that was found during the process. Um, and that, this one's the only exception in terms of um, it's it's not painted at all. I mean, there's an underpainting of just white, but it's basically it's a cotton sheet adhered to the surface. Is the pattern? Thank you for that. So there are other uh, questions uh, that have come in. Uh, Melissa Steiger asks, uh, do you lucid dream? Do you? Ah, interesting. Well, yeah, when dreams come up, people ask this sometimes. And my feeling about that, and, and uh, other people may seem to feel differently, but I, I always feel like my impression of, of what that is, is that you then uh, control what's happening in your dream and you can, uh, make it go the way you want it to and do the things that you want to do in your dream and so on. And to, for my purposes, at least that's um, sort of counter to what I'm after in the dream. I'm, I, what I'm looking to the dream for is that it's something that's uh, not, uh, I'm not consciously controlling. I'm not rationally in charge of, I'm not imposing my will on it. It's, it's, it's free, uh, alien otherworldly content that's coming to me from somewhere else. Why, why do I want to get in there and start ordering it around? That, you know, that's kind of opposite of what I want from a dream. But I also may not understand what lucid dreaming really is because I haven't done it. I'm basing this on what, what people say about that. So I, maybe there's more to it. Great. And Molly has actually shared the interview you did. So thank you for that, Molly. So she mentioned, of course, in the chat field, you can all say that, but how fascinating it was to see the close-ups on the interview of the painting, the pencil marks, the way the patterns were constructed, kind of the, uh, the mechanics of the art making. Um, again, not to speak for Molly here, of course. Uh, Lisa has asked the question, Ken, what relationship, if any, uh, do you think your work has to more explicitly documentary archive or archiving? Is there a documentary aspect to the work? Um. There's an effort to be uh, faithful to something that's that's a little external to my control. That might be related to documentary work. However, I don't, um, you know, it's all coming from me. I mean, I suppose even if I'm not consciously making up the dreams, I'm, I'm the author. And even though there are elements of the paintings that I'm not, um, I'm trying to not be too deliberate about, you know, I, I, I don't think it qualifies as, as documentary in that sense. Uh, there, there isn't a, really any, I'm trying to think, is there any content to it that's external to me? Everything's processed through me. I'm looking at things that are from other places and, I, and I'm using them, but, I, but it's all processed one way or another through my sensibility, like it or not. Um, so, you know, I, have been watching, uh, Frederick Wiseman, uh, his, his most recent film recently, and I'm thinking about great documentary and that it's, it's wonderful and it's, he, he's amazing and, and other, you know, I'm, I'm interested in it as a form, but it's not, I don't think it's what I'm doing is documentary in that regard. Excuse me, Ronnie follows up with a question. Uh, asking, are these dreams just from this year, um, or what's the time frame? Um, the the dreams that I have, uh, these texts uh, that I've used go back about five or six years, and and actually, uh, only one of the paintings is from a dream that happened within the last year, I think. Uh, the final one that I read was a fairly recent dream, and that's the most recent of the paintings. But since I was using uh, them in order of occurrence as, as a way of sort of objectively moving through them, really most of them, the paintings were made, you know, a year or two years ago at most, and the dreams were all that are in those particular paintings may have been five or six years ago. 
Right. And the paintings, if I recall correctly, they're from the last two years. Mm -hmm. Yeah, uh, yes, yes, uh, 18 through 20, basically. Yeah. Excellent. So uh, Mary Birmingham uh, asked a question. Uh, can you talk about the significance of the placement of the text within the physical voids? Um, and meaning uh, having it be in a recessed uh, cutaway inset area. Um, I've been all my work like for, mm -hmm. yes, I, I, I was seeing her nodding there. Uh, my work for um, more than 10 years, maybe, I don't know how long it goes back, has been really involved with the, the painting as a physical object. Uh, earlier on that had to do with taking the, the parts of the painting and sort of re configuring them or having them be in different air layers of priority than what they normally are, like bringing the, the support structure to the front or, you know, sort of demoting the, the painted part of the canvas to some, some other role in the painting. But in any event, thinking about the painting as, a, as an object and thinking about it, um, its construction and, it, and its uh, identity, uh, as an open-ended thing that could be that could be uh, intervened on, so that's one thing. I mean, I think cutting into the surface and in setting is is part of that of my history of doing that, and part of my sense of the painting as a as an object and not just an image. Also, though, and this is probably the better answer. Uh, I'm interested in these this conjunction or this uh, interaction or or, or um, things that different in kind coming together, a text and a pattern or a text and a, and a visual composition, or in a little earlier paintings, maybe a photograph of a, of a person or a photograph of a sculpture and a flat pattern that's a painting, that's an abstract painting. And those, and those things are just different. They're different in kind. And I'm interested in the, the intersection of, of the differentness of those things. And, uh, you know, if I look back at um, people who have done collage or, or worked with text in paintings, many of them that I really like, but often what they did, if I think about uh, Robert Rauschenberg using collage, he treated it like the paint. He treated it like everything else. It, it was all, it all became sort of material that interacted in the same ways with each other on many levels. And it was really interwoven. And I wanted to preserve the differentness um, or, or Basquiat has text in his paintings but it's painted and it, it is very consistent with the, his, the way he makes an image as well. But I wanted to preserve the differentness. I, I wanted that sense, sort of sense of alienness between these different things uh, preserved. So I wanted them on uh, separate surfaces and, and um, yeah. Great, so I want to uh, just take a moment to acknowledge all the great questions that are coming in and please keep them rolling. Uh, if you have questions for Ken, just type them into the chat field. And we have a few more for you, Ken. Uh, sure. Next one coming from Lee uh, Kirby. The images and patterns are tightly controlled. Uh, is this a desire to quote unquote order reality versus letting the dreams roll? That's an interesting question. Uh, hmm. Well, I, I don't think the the um, composition of the painting inhibits the whatever might happen in the dream. If it's a kind of rolling, then it, then it rolls. Because as a text, you don't experience it. I mean, you, it's a little bit a visual thing, but, it's, but mainly the visual part of it is writing, which you then read. And then really the images are in your head. And they roll wherever they roll. You know, it, you experience it has a different syntax. It works in a different way. So um, again, I think it's about uh, those things um, colliding with one another. Um, it is true that I, my um, my way of composing or my way of maybe the patterns that I choose to make are. Um, have a certain quality of, uh, of uh, formal abstraction maybe or something versus gestural abstraction. But I, I wouldn't necessarily 
uh, equate, um, you know, uh, a, a loose painterly paint flinging approach with dreams. I don't think those have anything more in common than with any other type of paint handling. And I, and I don't really want them to work together anyway, even if they did. Excellent. So uh, Sarah Brenneman asks, um, following up on that, how are you cataloging the images you use in the paintings? Are you saving images that you think uh, you may use later, or are you searching for images that work exactly content-wise within the paintings and or the text? I'm sorry, Matthew, I didn't catch the very last part of that sentence. Okay, uh, let me read that one more time. Uh, are you cataloging the images you use in the paintings? And are you saving images that you might use later? Or are you searching for images aesthetically or content-wise with the paintings or the text? I, I, um, in, I, I sort of worked with a couple of folders. I had a folder full of texts of dreams. And I, I did at a certain, uh, over, you know, maybe on a couple of occasions, pull together images that uh, uh, I was interested in certain kinds of imagery. I, I remember that I went through a period where I was looking at um, sort of, and, and I, I'm not sure I could really tell you why, but I was looking at kind of graphic uh, commercial design stuff from um, maybe 30 or 40 years ago. And I, uh, you know, in retrospect, I can say maybe some of these dreams are, you know, have some connection or some like kind of wispy thread that goes back to my childhood. That's that's the time period maybe that that's connected to. But uh, so there were some that I, I, I came out of research when I was looking at like wallpaper or fabric designs from the seventies, maybe. There's a few that have a connection to that. As I said, there are some that are um, really my invention there's one, it's not hanging in the show, but it's at the gallery that is based on a uh, Giovanni de Paolo uh, painting, a, a Sienese uh, early Renaissance painter who I love and I love the painting that I've just always had a feeling about. Um, in that case, there was a connection, not a kind of a content connection, but a formal connection. That, that is a painting where uh, it, it's a representation of a temple and in the lower right-hand corner of his painting, the, the floor is broken. And it's this, this mysterious thing. You see the, the corner of the floor is broken away and there's a dark space underneath. So I felt interested in having that, um, I think that related, I, I, let me put it this way, that related for me to this sort of uh, multiple levels that are occurring in the painting, the, the inset versus the surface. So in a way, I guess they come from all over the place. There's, there's the detail and there's the overall of that, uh, the painting that's based on the Giovanni de Paolo. So they come from a variety of sources. Uh, somehow that, somehow that it gets filtered to, uh, into a single stream of things that I might use. But, uh, you know, if, if I'm really looking at it carefully, there's a, there's a, there's a variety of ways that they come about. If you don't mind, I'm gonna just skip ahead just briefly. I will come back for sure to your question, Carol, but there's a question you were just talking about sort of early experiences and influences. There's a question that I think was by uh, Mary uh, Alexander. She writes, um, uh, would you speak to the influence of your Southern heritage on these works? <laughs> See it in the fluidity of consciousness. So how does the Mississippi in you um, play out in these paintings? Oh, that's an interesting question. I don't know. I mean. I, I could say that um, there's a there's a sort of a, a storyteller storytelling kind of thing that I experience always experienced with my family growing up. I was never a uh, you know someone who who uh, was a rock and tour, but there's something about whenever my family gets together, there's a lot of uh, telling and even repeating of, this, of, of stories and narratives. So I don't know, maybe that has something to do with what happens with these dreams. You know, it's a, I, 
I'm not sure, you know, I mean, I think Mary Edith maybe is getting at something else with the, the, the idea of fluidity. And I, I kind of like that, but I don't know what, I don't know what it is, you know. I'm gonna, uh, I'm sorry, I'm just jumping in here because yeah. <laughs> I've known Ken a long time, but but this is, this show is so you, and the, sh the works are so wonderful. And it, it's coming out of this deep wellspring. Um, I was trying to tease out that, I think Walker Percy said for a Southerner, and Walker Percy, your fellow Mississippian, um, for 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 a Southerner, uh, the past isn't really history. It, it's not even really the past. It it lives with us, and I'm a Southerner, so I'm, it it's it's so present. People aren't really gone. Isn't They're that just, Faulkner? Right. Is is it Faulkner? Yeah. It, it was either Percy or. or um, I'm going to vote for Faulkner, but but the yeah, quote, yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I, I get your, I get your, well, your, your, yeah, that's for sure. It's that, Percy who says for Southern, Southerner geography is destiny, but um, there you that's go. what I was going for. So <laughs> I'll, I'll shut up now. <laughs> it, it, was Falk, it was Faulkner and they quoted it in that, you know, that movie that's out antebellum. They quoted it at the beginning of that movie. Thank you, Laurie. And thank you. Uh, uh, where'd you go? You disappeared on my screen, but thank you for those comments. Uh, Carol asked a question early on uh, that I skipped ahead over. Uh, I'm curious about your perception of the tone of each dream and if that tone or tones influenced each painting. So is there a tone involved in these visual verbal? I, I, th I think that I think there are tones that emerge and they vary wildly and I'm interested in that. Uh, and it, it, again, I have to I have to confess that it's not something that I'm. Well, I have to say, uh, to the extent that it it works, and I'm uh, convinced by it, it's not something that I'm making happen or controlling too much. That that's what makes it more interesting for me. I think it's better than if I tried to create that. Great. And uh, Rick follows up with a question: Human inhabitants are a constant. But fewer celebrities, such as Jim Carrey, which is such a non sequitur for me. I cracked up when I saw that you're painting, to be honest. Um, but again, uh, but fewer celebrities uh, than unnamed anonymous persons. Is this imbalance surprising to you? That's an interesting question. Yeah, who who turns up in dreams? That um, so I think if if I heard that right, m more uh, that there. There's a range of kinds of people in that regard, and and more often people are unnamed, but then the celebrities do make appearances. Um, yeah, I think that's interesting. I'm not sure what to say about it. Uh, I I was kind of glad that um, I was thinking that when I read the the one um, that had the reference to Catherine Bradford, I was thinking, oh, wouldn't it be cool if she was here? tonight for this <laughs> I don't, and she maybe she falls somewhere in between on that on that range but um it was funny to me to have a dream with Jim Carrey in it I, you know I, I who know who knows what's going on in these dreams I mean if, if I wasn't paying attention to them and recording to recording them I I would and I'm still even so I'm still just as mystified as to why is it this person and not that person and someone that I'm don't think that I would normally even think about or, you know, it, it, it's very uh, mysterious and that's, the, that's the beauty of it to me. Great. I don't so think I answered that question very fully, but that's, that's what it is, I think. Good, good. So there's a question from Janine Ryan, who is asking specifically about your exhibition. Can you talk about the placement of works within the exhibition? lower versus what appears to be standard height. And while you do that, I will show some uh, exhibition views, if that's cool. Sure. Um, I, because, of, because of COVID and, and you know everything is because of COVID now, um, this show, I had a, a, an extra long time to think about it. Uh, we, we were originally thinking about May and uh, I do maquettes of, of before, usually before a solo show. So I, I, I did a scale model of gallery and I played with a lot of different kind of placements of the, the pieces in the space. And there was a point where I had paintings uh, lying down uh, 
as if maybe as if sleeping, you know, uh, that I, I got past that notion, but, uh, I liked the one thing is I, I, I like, you know, I talked before about the, the painting as an object. So having them, uh, leaning against the wall and, you know, braced with their two little, you know, feet that they stand on leaning against the wall, as opposed to hanging, uh, it has to do maybe with the object nature of painting. Also, these paintings are all identical in proportion. They're all the same, uh, same rectangle, same size. I mean, they're maybe different in pattern, different in color, but they're the same proportion and the same size. And uh, I, on the one hand, that seriality, that repetition, to me it is relevant because you know it's it's that it's that repetition. Every, every night we go to sleep. We have a dream maybe or multiple dreams. The dream is enclosed within the sleep and then we wake up and then we start again and we have a day and then we go to sleep. You know, it's this repetitive cycle that happens over and over and and the dream always falls within the sleep. So in that sense, the repetition I, I, I kind of embraced with these paintings, it's much more that way. My last show at Minus Space, the paintings were varied in size, they varied in shape. But in this case, there, were all, there was a certain amount of repetition. And I think on some level, I also wanted to break that repetition, you know, so beyond just having them sort of be objects on the floor, maybe they're, maybe they're getting drowsy, maybe they can't hang on the wall anymore, but also maybe I just wanted to have a little bit of a, some variation in the rhythm, you know, instead of just uh, identical placement over and over and over again. I think I needed a little bit of relief from that. So a little syncopation, a little variation was important to me as well. So, so I don't know, you know, there's three reasons and we could lay them in different orders of priority. Great, thank you, Ken. Uh, Angela asks, I wonder if painting uh, these works has had any influence on the way you dream. So does it go the other direction, Ken? I do not know. That's a very interesting question. Uh, I, I, my guess is no. <laughs> my guess is that, is that that process and the unconscious is uh, a, a, a much uh, an independent force that, that does the thing that it does, whether or not I make a painting about it. it that's my guess. Uh, sort of the same way your body operates and functions and does certain things, right? Kind of regardless of what you think about it. Um, so that that's my guess. I, I don't think so. I mean, it, where, where maybe there's a little marginal place that that's true is, is if I'm paying attention to them more and I'm, there's, there's that place in between sleep and wake on, on the either end where I'm a little asleep and a little awake. And, um, you know, there's a, there's a soft borderline between what I'm, what I'm thinking when I'm thinking about a painting or what I'm thinking about, or when I'm just off in, in, uh, sort of an unconscious uh, dreamland or whatever. And maybe there's a little, little uh, border there, but I, th I think the dreams are, are bigger than the paintings. Great. So we have time for just a few more questions. And uh, Carol, uh, question wrote a comment. It's just disappeared on my screen. How about that? Where'd you go, Carol? Uh, St. Augustine, I believe said something to the effect of, quote, thank God I am not responsible for my dreams. What do you, what do you think about that quote, Ken? I agree completely. <laughs> that that is that is very much in line with what I what what and, I think. Um, yes, and thank God I don't have to be responsible. You know, they they come, it's free. They come unbidden. I don't have to create them. I don't have to think them up. I don't have to edit them. They're they're just they come. Terrific. Um, Saba asks, is understanding a dream through the uh, respective painting also part of your process? So does it give you deeper insights into the dream by making the painting? No. No, no, I don't think so. I, I think, I think uh, the painting becomes a new experience, which is, you know, the, the image plus the dream. And I can think things about that and, and have, uh, that, that becomes a thing that I can experience or think about or be, feel. But I'm not 
looking for deep interpretations in the dreams. I mean, I'd be happy if they show up, but but it's it's not about uh, divination and trying to find what's behind the dream really for me. I mean, I, I don't mind if there is something or if it shows up, but that's not really what I'm thinking of. Great. Uh, David Keith asks an interesting question. Uh, do other people's dreams find their way into your dream books or painting ideas? This question kind of reminds me of Bob. I'll let you be in my dream if I can be in yours. <laughs> yes. That's a good, that's an How interesting thought. In your work? Uh, I don't mind that idea. I, I haven't ever done that, but it, that could be interesting. Um, that seems like something that I'm, I might try if the occasion uh, arose. I mean, the, the only trouble, I don't know if it's trouble, but the, the only thing I wonder about is um, I feel like I know how much I um, try to keep my meddling hand out of the dream when I write it down myself. And I don't necessarily understand uh, what someone else is thinking when they write theirs down, but maybe I wouldn't have to worry about that. If someone handed me a text and said, here's, here's a dream, you know, maybe I could make a painting out of that. I experimented with something a little bit like that with some of the, some dream works in that I had someone else uh, handwrite the text. So it wasn't my hand. When I first started doing these, I was kind of thinking like, you know, I'm, what should my handwriting be like? Do I want to try to do something particular with it? Do I want to just let it be, you know, sloppy and, and be whatever it is? Should it look visual or should it, can it just be, you know, uh, my note to myself? And one of the things I tried was let, letting other people do the handwriting of the thing just to see if that made it feel different or, or what would it be like to use that? What would it be like to distance myself from it just a little bit by doing that? Uh, but I haven't ever actually used someone else's dream, but maybe I would. Great. We have time just for two more questions. I want to make sure uh, Dr. Billy Gruner is included here. He's coming to us all the way from Australia today. Hi, Dr. Billy. How are you? Hi. Uh, old friends, long time uh, participants in the gallery from way back. Um, Mariana, though, however, asks, uh, what goes into your decision making when pairing patterns, colors, materials with the text? Do you find that you assign specific colors to dreams when you think about them? Um, no, no, it, it, it really, I, 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 it's hard to say what the criterion is, but I, I try to uh, keep my uh, opinions out of it <laughs> in a way. I mean, it, it kind of, um, as I said, I was working through the, the dreams chronologically and and then I had also visual ideas and I tried to pair them with, without making deliberate connections. That was more interesting to me. And then um, one question uh, from uh, Dr. Billy Gruner. Um, in Aboriginal art, it uh, is both made on the ground, the body itself uh, kind of defines the size of the work if I'm understanding that correctly, Billy. Are you interested in that idea in the full, uh, in the, excuse me, the idea of the view in plan form as if these works might be uh, object forms in space? You might, uh, you mentioned that, but moved away from it um, in this hang. And uh, the reference point, of course, is Aboriginal art and dreaming. Um, any, any thoughts on that, Ken? To think of it in, in, in uh, reference to Aboriginal art is an interesting thought. Um, and I'm, I'm, a, I'm aware of that as a, as a kind of a source in Aboriginal art, although I'm not, I don't know a lot about it. I'm not sure I understand the question, the part about the ground and plan. Can, can you um, bring that back to me a little bit? I'm not sure I understand what the question is there exactly. Is it okay if I say go right ahead? Uh, of course. <clears throat> yeah, because I'm, lately I've been working with this area and I'm fascinated by it. And the, I've been working with Aboriginal people and their art is dreaming. That's all they ever talk about, this idea of living a dream. But their processes are very physical and they usually produce the work sitting on the ground, looking at it like a Rauschenberg or something where you, you're looking at the world from a kind of 
plan view like that. So the picture planes dropped off the wall. And so they make these works like rugs on the ground and then they don't really care where they go. How, how, how these things get hung is our kind of nice way of decorating and everything. So I, I, I find it fascinating that we have these different views of how we view the picture, the pictorial and, and, but also how we see dreaming. Obviously they have a kind of quite a, like a religious connection for it all and to do with family and place. But in a lot of ways, we're no different. Well, I, I think that's true. Uh, maybe I missed an opportunity uh, when I uh, decided not to lay them flat on the floor <laughs> and let them sleep that way. Um, that's interesting. I mean, a, a piece of, it, you know, when I said before about how earlier on uh, my work was thinking about re, um, realigning the parts of painting and taking them out of their normal priority or part of that is it was taking on kind of consciously and knowingly saying, okay, well, we have, uh, there's this inherited language of, you know, modernist painting and European painting and, and all that, that, that we have. So I'm, I'm going to uh, do something that, relates to that language. You know, I'm not going to just repeat that language, but I'm going to maybe play, play with those terms. And that gives me something to, to maybe argue with or uh, play with, fight against, however you want to talk about it. So, you know, to the degree that there are pictures on the wall or pictures propped against the wall and, uh, and they're in rectangles and, and they have, as you said, it, it has a rep, uh, relationship with decoration and, you know, all of the things that, that European and American, you know, sort of Western tradition painting has, it, it is dealing with those conventions and it is, you know, uh, maybe arguing with those conventions, but it's, it is a language one can um, take to play with, to subvert, whatever. But I would say that's, that's the difference, perhaps. Great, and then one final wrap-up question from Linda Ferguson. And this is a question for Ken. I think it'd be great also for everyone here to answer this question as well. But the question is, do you dream in color? <laughs> yes. Anyone else, show of hands? I certainly do. Yeah. Yes. It seems like a fear of Excellent. So thank you for that question. Yes. And thanks to uh, everyone here for um, your marvelous questions. And Ken, thank you for a wonderful presentation. This is uh, miraculous that we're able to um, all convene in this way, particularly during these times where I think we're all craving community and craving interaction with each other and craving meaningful conversations. So thank you all for being here with us this evening and Ken for a great presentation. Uh, really, really appreciate it um, so much. Uh, now Ken's show uh, continues at the gallery through January 30th. So there's plenty of time to see it. Uh, I am currently open only on Saturdays. These are our special COVID hours. Saturdays only from 11 to five. Uh, if you can't make it during those times and you are nearby, just let me know. Uh, I can certainly meet you at the gallery really anytime. That's going to be safe and cautious and careful for uh, our community as humanly possible. So again, Saturdays only 11 to five. And I look forward to seeing all of you in the gallery, continuing our conversation and um, just wishing everyone to stay safe and healthy and uh, see you all uh, again soon. I would like to say thank you, Matthew, also for this and thank you everyone who came and, and for the wonderful conversation. I appreciate it very much. Fabulous, Ken. So a round of applause for you. Thank you so much. Thank you, Ken. Wonderful. And thank you all for joining us. See you soon. Good night, everyone. And good morning, Billy. From the yeah. future. <laughs> <laughs> it's a long way away, right? Uh, we're happy to have you here. Thank you all. <laughs>